session. We are going to start uh, with the talk uh, jointly given by uh, Nal Kalbrunner uh, and Eric um, Els uh, Elson, and it's going to be about their paper, Efficient Neural Audio Synthesis.
Hello. Uh, my name is Nal. Uh, uh, I'll talk about efficient neural audio synthesis. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, this is work done at uh, DeepMind together with my colleague uh, Eric Elson at Google Brain. Uh, and I'm currently uh, uh, in Google Brain uh, Amsterdam, which is a new uh, exciting location for uh, Google Brain. Uh, this is not the office, by the way. Um, so um, this talk is about maximizing uh, sampling, basic, sampling efficiency within uh, extremely tight computational constraints for a uh, sequence for a sequence model that requires an, a lot of steps uh, per second. Um, and so you may recall uh, WaveNet. WaveNet is a uh, convolutional neural network that uh, basically transforms a bunch of linguistic features that represent text into a raw audio signal. And the way this works, uh, for, for the text-to-speech ta uh, task, the way this works is basically you take uh, a sentence, you compute with some simple model some linguistic features, you upsample them with an encoder, and then you have what looks here, what is represented here, which is the wave and decoder. And it's, it's a deep convolutional neural network, which is masked, so actually has, has these half kernels per layer, which only look into the past. And this structure that you see here actually in WaveNet, it's actually repeated three times. Uh, so you, we, we, we go, the, the dilation factors go from one to, uh, to, to 1,024, and then they, they repeat this way uh, three times. So uh, the, the intuition actually original thing was to capture very long range dependencies from the past. Now, uh, WaveNet is, uh, is, is, is a great neural network. Um, but um, it's also infamously uh, slow to sample from. And the reason, is, uh, the reason is because basically every step of which one usually has, uh, t let's say, 24,000 steps per a for, 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 a, for a second of audio, for a second of high quality audio, one must go through all these different layers. And there's about, uh, say, 30 of them or 60 of them, depend depending how you count. Now, um, to be able to efficiently sample, we need to understand why, why, what, 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 what are the two factors that actually make this sampling algorithm so slow, from the sampling from wave directly so slow. And, and bear, bearing, uh, a lot, you know, bearing some details, uh, but without simplifying, there are basically two dimensions that we really have to uh, work on to, make, to, to basically to speed up this, uh, this sampling, sam sampling uh, algorithm. And one dimension is the, the, the one dimension is, is a true um, amount of flops, amount of computation that you actually need to produce a sample for for one second of audio, and the other dimension is memory bandwidth, uh, and this is sometimes forgotten, but the size of the model is not the only, of course, not the only uh, factor in in uh, in uh, determining the time that it takes to compute something. The other factor is actually how much memory bandwidth you need uh, based on the computation. And when you have a very sequential computation that doesn't reuse any activations or any parameters for all the different steps, then memory bandwidth becomes the bottleneck. So what happens with WaveNet, because it has about, uh, the original wave has about 45 million parameters, or something like this, you need about roughly, roughly 100 million uh, floating point operations to produce one uh, second of audio. And because it's a sequential structure, you also need a huge amount of memory bandwidth. And this made the generation from WaveNet uh, slow, no matter how, how cleverly you implement it, it's extremely hard to get to, uh, to real time. Now our goal is to, get, is to work under, this, under the constraints of these red and green lines, right? So we want to actually get down to something that looks, that, that sort of lives in the lower, lower quadrant, actually, so, you know, say on an extremely efficient mobile CPU platform that we can sample from um, in real time. And um, uh, so these, ra these red lines and the green lines basically roughly mean you know, comfortably above real time on that platform, on a single GPU or on a single CPU. So our goal would be to, take, to move this dot and get all the way down, thinking about the two dimensions that we have to optimize in. Now the first dimension that we actually want to optimize is, okay, Waven has 45 million parameters. The first question that we ask ourselves when we started working on this, you know, can we make a smaller model that is equally good, that performs equally well, but has you know, many, many fewer parameters. 
Uh, and I want to introduce, and this is basically a result of a whole bunch of optimization. And initially, the, the mind were, were GPU, to, to, so to, to, to run this on a single GPU, basically. And, um, and, and it is, but this has stayed like this for a while now, and it's basically not easy to improve on this model in terms of quality and number of parameters. But um, it's the waiver and end model, which is the first model that we work on to get to the, to the very lower quadrant in our, in our, in our uh, optimization process, is basically a recurrent neural network that, um, so now we work with actually 16-bit signals, so we have two eight, two eight bit signals which are given as input to the, to the waiver and end in the, in the audio signal. So let's imagine we get to this last point here. So you have two eight bits, the orange and the, and the purple, so two eight bit samples of a, of a, of a, of that, that are sort of, you take a 16 bit sample divided into two eight bits, the coarse, the coarse bits and the fine bits. And then the waiver and end basically has this double state and this double prediction softmax that looks something like this. This is the previous step. You have, a, you have a transformation from the previous step onto half of the, of the next step, in the next state, that takes as input the, fir the first course eight bits. And then you go and you produce a distribution, a softmax over the next course eight bits. Then you sample from there, you put this back in together with the, with the weights, for, uh, together with the, um, with the activation coming from the previous state for the fine bits, which is the, which is the purple part of the state. Uh, and, and then you sample, and you, and you sample um, a probability distribution over the fine bits. So this is actually a completely autoregressive model, and then you go into the next step by sampling and putting the, putting the inputs there. So we don't actually break, and waiver and is completely autoregressive, we don't break any dependencies, and it has a cyclical structure, and the cyclical structure is actually optimized for, uh, to reduce the number of separate matrix vector uh, operations, and basically to make it run very fast on a GPU. Now, it is, uh, this, uh, this structure together with the double softmax actually gives about three or four million parameters, about 10 times less, fewer parameters than the WaveNet model. Um, so where do we put it? Now, it turns out that, so, uh, the, so these are actually logarithmic scales on bo both the X and Y axis, uh, schematic logarithmic scales. And so with about 10 times fewer parameters, with the wa waiver and N actually, the model just presented, we actually get into this GPU part of the, of the graph. And if you use, um, if by, by, some, by, by, by mapping basically this model onto GPU kernels, we actually get about three times faster than, 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 um, than um, real time production on this model. But this is not sufficient, right? We, we have a much, we have another, not, at least another 10x to go um, on, bo on both aspects of memory bandwidth and, and uh, floating point operations. So the next thing we thought is then, okay, uh, yeah, oh wait, oh yes, so these are actually the, the wave and quality, uh, the wave and quality results. Um, on a head-to-head -head, uh, direct comparison, which is one of the most reliable ways of comparing these models on a test set, on, te on test set with actual productions, the WaveNet original 60-layer, uh, 512-unit WaveNet is as good as the wave of with, uh, 896, with a single-layer wave, wave with 896 units. And so about 10 times as para fewer parameters. So, we train this for about a thousand steps of backpropagation, back so actually the whole thing about longer, longer dependencies changes here a little bit. I mean, do, how much do we actually need is, all, is always an open question. It's just what we learn from deep learning. Um, so now we get to the second step that, that brings us to closer to the lower quadrant. And this is the idea of subscaling. Subscaling is, is, is actually very simple, although it might look slightly tricky. I just want to, I want to sort of show it how ha what happens in the 2x case. The intuition is, that I think the, the slightly sort of, uh, the insight is basically how do, we, um, how do we generate multiple steps a second without introducing local independence assumptions? And that's like super important because like, autoregressive models are all about local independence, uh, lo lo all about local dependencies. And so um, that the high quality, that their high quality comes from these local dependencies. And if you break those, you're gonna start hitting artifacts. It's a standard story with autoregressive models for images, for text, for anything you want. So the, the, the question always remains, how do we preserve all local dependencies uh, with, uh, but actually introduce some parallelism? Now the simple trick actually is as before, take this, eight, this, 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 take this 16 bit sequence, now we can treat it as one, as 16 bit samples, as an, the, 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 it doesn't matter. For a 2x parallelism factor, and we'll get down to 16x later, but for 2x two, two parallelism factor, what happens, you basically, divide, you basically sub, sub sample the sequence into two, um, two like by taking the, the second sample from the sequence each. Uh, and uh, you start a generation on the first, um, basically, it's a, it's a recursive process, right? I mean, you start a generation on the, on the second steps, on the, on the first of these slices, of these subsample sizes, 
Once you generate a whole bunch of them, in this case, let's say, where, uh, where you have this co future context f, which is, the, which is the number of sizes you let your first wave RNN, subscale wave RNN model go into the future, then you start conditioning your second wave RNN model, which is the same model, just in batch mode, on the prediction of the first one. So, so you see how at every step here, now we're producing two samples at the same time, two 16-bit samples at the same time. But, what, but these samples here depends on, dep has all the local dependencies that are actually uh, that actually uh, preserves all the local dependencies of the of the lower of the lower um, of, the, of the first slice. And um, wh what is in practice, this what, what is what are these four future samples that happen here in the lower slice? In practice, are more like you know, let's say 500. And so any dependencies beyond that future and now are basically non-existent in these models. That you don't actually you don't even encode them in practice. So what happens is that you, ha you basically you, ha you have this factorization of the distribution. Um, you only throw away some really far dependencies into the future uh, that, that you didn't code before anyway because the samples are just too long. And, and, and then you're producing multiple samples uh, per step. And it looks something like this in batch mode, basically. And you see how two of them are presented and then you, you reshape them back at the top and you put them one next to each other. And that's how the whole generation works. Now, it turns out you can do this trick. This, this, this is a sort of summary of the trick. It turns out you can actually do this trick up to 16x, up, up to a factor of 16. So instead of producing 24 kilohertz or a signal sequential, you're producing one and a half, kilo, uh, one and a half kilohertz uh, signals, a 16 of them at the same time. Now, this is actually pretty drastic. I mean, it's, sorry, it's, fa it's a fairly drastic sort of factorization. And um, uh, again, a head -to -head in a head-to-head -head quality um, experiment, there's actually no difference between the wave RNN and the uh, this subscale wave RNN, 16x, and the original wave RNN. Um, and once you have 16x sort of reuse of computation and weights, then all the, all the memory bandwidth bottlenecks reduce very, very significantly. So um, what we see here basically is that the subscript wave RNN and the wave RNN 896 are actually about the same in quality when they're compared head to head. And, um, uh, and also in likelihoods they get pretty close and although comparing likelihoods with different, different factorizations is a tricky issue, but they get pretty close and mean opinion scores as well. So now that we have the wave and we have the wave RNN and, and now, but we, we did, because we reduced, because we have parallel, parallelism, we, we didn't actually reduce the flops, but we reduced the memory bandwidth. So from, from, from this spot, we can actually plot the subscript wave RNN a bit to the left because we reduce significantly the memory bandwidth by, by a factor of, let's say, 16, actually. Uh, and on this log logarithmic scale, that's sort of roughly where it goes. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, but there's a parallel wavenet model which will be presented later today, uh, also worked by, uh, by, 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 by our group. And um, there actually you have even more memory bandwidth, but the, the number of flops remain around, around the same, so you would plot it roughly here. I'm not going to explain that model, but uh, just as a, as a general idea here. Well, that's great, but we're still missing one last big step, another 10x optimization roughly on both the memory bandwidth side and on the floating, uh, uh, on, the, on the flop side to really get to, uh, to sampling 24,000 steps, 16-bit samples per step on a, on a mobile phone. So, uh, and this gets us to the sparse wave RNN, which is where Eric will talk. Thanks, Noel. Um, so, Based on uh, some prior work that I had done, we decided to take a look at making the weight matrices in the wave RNN model um, sparse. So basically here, that means most of the arrows which were denoting um, you know, linear layers, basically, uh, we looked at making those sparse linear layers. And um, sparsity has been tried in the past uh, for many different problems. It's often run into uh, practical problems, which is that uh, people have usually looked at, I have a model that has some number of parameters, and then I just look at making it sparse and taking parameters away, and of course at some point the quality eventually starts to degrade. Um, and what you're looking at here is just the evolution of one of the matrices uh, sparsity patterns as training progresses. and. Um, the other problem that has generally been run into with sparsity is that we don't often think that we can run, um, once we find the final sparsity pattern, we don't think that we can run it very efficiently on the hardware that we have. So even if we succeed in reducing the parameters significantly, uh, we often think that, well, it didn't really help me run it faster. Um, 
And so we decided to look at the problem in a slightly different way and basically say, instead of reducing the number of parameters uh, from a set uh, model size, let's say, one, can we actually run the, the sparse matrix multiplies efficiently? And it turns out if we use just a small amount of uh, block structure, then the answer is on mobile CPUs, we can actually run the sparse matrix multiplies uh, just as fast as we can run dense matrix multiplies. Uh, and knowing that um, basically means that we reduce the problem to simply how many parameters are there in our matrices. Um, if it doesn't matter whether they're dense or sparse, how fast they run. Um, and so we decided to, to make some plots basically where each one of these curves corresponds to a constant number of parameters, uh, which given the sparse kernels we wrote basically means that each one of these curves corresponds to a constant uh, inference time. Um, and what you can see is that as the sparsity increases uh, significantly, so the farthest right points on this plot are around 98% sparse, um, the negative log likelihood of the model drops significantly. Um, and what this is saying is if we increase the state size basically of the RNN, but make the connectivity uh, between the, the activations of that RNN very sparse, we actually get a much uh, more efficient model than densely connecting a much smaller state size in the RNN. Um, and this, this was actually somewhat surprising to us and uh, it turns out to be something very powerful that we can take advantage of because the, um, the models that are most sparse, around 98% or so, uh, correspond to dense models that would have about 35 times as many parameters in terms of, uh, for similar quality. Um, this is just a, a, a table showing that we can in fact achieve similar speeds for dense and sparse multiplies on uh, the mobile CPUs. Uh, mobile CPUs are a little bit special uh, in this particular case because their ratio of flops and bandwidth is much more equal than for example modern GPUs. Um, and then this is a table showing that the MOS, which is again sort of the way that we measure the quality of the speech that's produced, is um, maybe slightly worse with the, the sparse models that we can run on the phone, but it's, um, it's still very, very high quality. Um, and so if we go back to this plot that we've been looking at, um, the reduction that we can get out of using sparsity is actually about the factor of 10 that we need to bring this dot uh, into the regime of being able to be run uh, locally on a mobile phone. So. So in the few years that since WaveNet came out, when the first sampling was happening at, you know, I think almost single digits of samples per second on a GPU, we've now uh, moved it all the way to be, being able to do 24,000 samples a second on, on a mobile phone. And uh, how much time is there? One minute? Uh, so maybe in the one minute that we have left, we can actually, um, we can just play you one, one sample from the phone. So um, let's see. So first I'm going to play the sample with the, um, the current on-device model, which is like a, a parametric synthesis model. Um, so let's see if we can do this here. Jeff Dean is my hero. Okay. And then we can switch it to, so now this is gonna be the, the model running on the phone. Um, Oops. So the model that runs on the phone right now. Jeff Dean is my hero. So let's try it one more time so you can hear it. Jeff Dean is my hero. So you can hear that the quality is, is much, you can hear the quality is much higher with the WaveNet synthesis over the parametric synthesis. So uh, with that, we would like to <laughs> conclude the talk and if we have time, take any questions. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, so the next speaker can come.
Okay. All right. So, so, so the next speaker is Gabriel Blender, and he's going to present his paper, uh, Understanding and Simplifying One-Shot Architecture Search. So this is joint work with a bunch of other people who are in Google Brain. Um, so in the last few years, there's been a lot of interest in this problem called neural architecture search, whose goal is to help humans find good neural network architectures for problems in computer vision and in other domains. Here's an example of how one of these algorithms works. First, we sample a candidate architecture from a human-defined search space. Next, we'll train the weights of this architecture for a fixed number of epochs on a data set like CIFAR-10. Then we'll evaluate this ar trained architecture and measure its accuracy on a held out validation set. And finally, based on the results we see, we will update a reinforcement learning controller that tries to favor in future iterations the kinds of architectures that have historically worked well. And we'll repeat this process over and over again. At the end of this, we will take the most promising architectures found by the search and retrain them from scratch. And at that point, we have the option of scaling things up. So for instance, we can increase the number of filters in each convolutional layer. Now, this approach has been successful in helping people achieve state-of-the-art accuracy in multiple problems, but there's also a catch, which is that it's incredibly resource-intensive to train these many different candidate architectures from scratch. Um, an example of one of these searches might actually try out five or 10 or 20,000 different architectures and take tens of thousands of GPU hours just to run a single search. So if we could actually speed things up, it would have two main benefits. The first is that it would make it, uh, these techniques available to a much larger range of practitioners and researchers instead of being limited to uh, a small number of resource-rich resource companies like Google. And second of all, even if you do have the resources to run these types of problems, this makes it much easier to scale up the search and run searches directly on a problem like ImageNet that looks a lot like some of the data sets we see in production, but also takes a long time to train models for. So there have been a number of different works uh, looking at different ways of speeding this up. Um, here I'm going to briefly discuss two of them. And both of these have the common idea of using a sh single shared set of model weights that are used to evaluate many different candidate architectures. The first is uh, something called ENAS, which was actually presented a couple of days ago um, at ICML. Um, and this alternates between two processes. The first process will sample candidate architectures as before from a human-defined search space. Then it evaluates them using these shared model weights that are reused throughout the entire process. And as before, the results are used to update an RL controller that tries to focus the search space on whichever kinds of architectures seem most promising. The second process periodically interrupts it to retrain these shared model weights for whichever part of the search space the RL controller is currently focusing on. And so there's this back and forth between updating the RL controller on one hand and updating the shared model weights on the other. The second approach that I want to get into is this thing called SMASH, um, or one-shot architecture search with hypernetworks. And this works a bit differently. First, we train a single shared set of model weights, which are used throughout the entire process, and then we freeze those weights. And from that point on, we start the architecture search proper by sampling candidate architectures, using a hypernetwork to adapt these frozen weights to the current architecture, and then evaluating the candidate architecture and measuring its accuracy using these adapted weights. And this process uh, is, again, repeated over and over again. Um, the efficiency gains in this case come from the fact that adapting the weights using a hypernetwork is more computationally efficient than trying to train an architecture from scratch. Uh, 
But in this work, we can actually show that we can still do architecture, architecture search even if we get rid of the hypernetwork entirely. And somehow, even though we are no longer using an RL controller to focus the search space or a hypernetwork to adapt the model weights, we're still able to use a single shared set of model weights to evaluate many different candidate architectures that look very different from each other. And so the first main contribution of this paper is actually a demonstration that this is possible. And I'll get into how we do this later in the talk. The second contribution of this work is to try to break things down and understand why is this working? How is it that we're using the single set of weights to evaluate many architectures that look very different from each other and somehow we're able to rank them more or less correctly? Because this is a work that's really focused on analysis. And although we're not trying to get state-of-the-art results here, we do actually get pretty close, but our real focus is on trying to understand how these things work. So in the rest of this talk, I am first going to describe the architecture search method in more detail. Then I will get into some of our analysis on the role of weight sharing in architecture search. And finally, I'll end with some concluding thoughts. So the idea here is to train a single large model um, containing many different operations, more than we think we'll actually need, and then to emulate different candidate architectures in the search space by zeroing out different subsets of the ops. So here's an example. Let's suppose that at a particular position in the network, we want to decide between applying a three by three convolution a five by five convolution, or a max pooling layer. Naively, we could try to train three different candidate architectures, one for each possible operation. What we're going to do instead is to train a single large architecture, the one-shot model, and then that contains all three operations, and then add their outputs together. And once we have this trained, we can emulate an architecture containing, say, just a max pooling operation by zeroing out the outputs of the other two ops. Now, in this particular example, there are only three operation or three different architectures in the entire search space. But in general, I can actually compose these blocks and stack these types of independent decisions on top of each other. And as I add more blocks, the size of the search space is actually going to grow exponentially with the number of blocks or the number of independent decisions I'm making, while the size of the one-shot model grows only linearly. So this is a potentially very powerful idea because it means that we can simulate many different architectures using a relatively compact model. Now, in the examples that I've given so far, I've deliberately tried to simplify things but the search space that we actually use in practice is much more complex. Um, we divide the architectures that we're searching over into a stack of cells, and within each cell, we are searching over both the operations that we apply at different positions in the network, and also over the patterns of skip connections that wire them together. So here, I'll fo in this talk, I'll focus on the operations, but you should keep in mind that we are actually searching over both. Once we have the one-shot model, and once it's trained, we can evaluate different candidate architectures in our search space by zeroing out uh, different subsets of the operations in the one-shot model, and then measuring the accuracy on a held-out validation set. And we can do this many times for many different candidate architectures using a single set of weights. At training time, the one-shot model is just a large neural network, and we can train it like any other, for instance, using stochastic gradient descent with momentum. The one wrinkle here is that at evaluation time, we plan to evaluate it with a large subset of the operations zeroed out. And if we don't properly train them or prepare the model for this, it will get very confused when we try to evaluate it this way and start generating terrible predictions across the board. 
And so in order to prepare for this kind of perturbation, we apply a similar transformation, path dropout at training time, where we randomly zero out a different subset of the operations in the model at each training step. So at this point, we have a method for training a one-shot model, which only needs to happen once. And then once it's trained, we can evaluate different candidate architectures by zeroing out different subsets of the operations. But what we plan to do at the end is take the most promising architectures by the, found by the search and retrain them from scratch. And so the question that we have to answer is, do the best architectures found by the one-shot model um, actually, are those actually the same as the best ones that we find um, from training from scratch? So to evaluate this, we have done a number of different experiments. I'll show you one which is borrowed from, based on a technique that was suggested originally in the SMASH paper, um, where we sample 50 random architectures from the search space, and for each one, we compute both the accuracy according to the one-shot model, which is on the x-axis, and also the accuracy from standalone training, which is on the y-axis. And the fact that there is a strong monotonic correlation between the two is actually very encouraging, because this suggests that, indeed, if we find architectures that well, work well according to the one-shot model, that they'll actually translate and work well in standalone training as well. So we've done a number of other evaluations on this as well. Um, the details are all in our paper. And in addition to the experiments on CIFAR-10, which I'm presenting here, we've also done experiments on ImageNet, which show similar trends. But I want to actually skip ahead now and move on to a second topic, which is some of the work that we've done trying to understand the role of weight sharing in architecture search. So, the problem that I posed at the beginning was how is it that we can train a single shared set of weights and use them to evaluate many different candidate architectures? Um, and this is how we originally came in and started looking at the problem. But there's another way of framing the problem, which I think is a lot more intuitive to think about. And that's in terms of starting with a large neural network, the one-shot model, and then trying to prune away the operations which are least useful for generating good predictions. So I'll start with a few observations that came up in our experiments. First of all, the best accuracies that we've seen in any model were actually obtained by turning on all of the possible operations in the search space. The only problem with this is that you end up with a very large model, and it turns out that you can remove most of the operations from the model without harming its accuracy very much. On the other hand, which operations you remove actually makes, makes a significant difference in terms of model quality. Some seem to be more useful for generating good predictions than others, and this is actually where architecture search is useful in figuring out which ops to keep and which ops to remove. So, our hypothesis for why this is working is that during, at training time, the one-shot model is actively trying to figure out which operations are useful for generating good predictions, and it develops strong opinions about these which are encoded directly in the model weights. So that at evaluation time, if we remove unimportant operations, or operations the one-shot model believes are not important, we'll see relatively small changes in the model's predictions, whereas if we remove operations that it thinks are really important, then we'll actually see much larger changes in the predictions, and typically also significant drops in model quality. So how can we actually try to test this hypothesis? Well, the claim is that some information about which operations are important is actually encoded directly in the model weights. And so in the previous section, we were trying to evaluate candidate architectures by zeroing out different subsets of the operations in the one-shot model and evaluating on a held-out validation set. But if this is actually encoded in the weights, then we should be able to figure out something very similar 
just by looking at the model's behavior on the training set and without explicitly comparing the model's outputs to any ground truth labels. Here's how we do it. Um, so the hypothesis here is that if we remove operations that it thinks are really important, then that will actually lead to large changes in the model's behavior. And so that's what we'll try to quantify. First, we will try to get a baseline. Um, what output would the model produce if it could use any of the operations in the search space that it wanted to? So in this example, I have a sample image from CIFAR 10. And this is an image classification problem. So the output is actually a probability distribution over classes. So there is, according to the model, 70% chance that this image is a frog, a 20% chance it's a cat, and so on. Then we take the same image and run it through the model again, this time with a subset of the operations zeroed out. And this gives us a different prob uh, uh, probability distribution over output classes. And finally, we can actually compare these two and figure out how much has the model's predictions changed by zeroing out these operations. And we do this for many different architectures. And for each one, we measure both the change in the model's predictions on the training set and also the drop in accuracy on the held out validation set. And according to our hypothesis, we would actually expect these, num these two numbers to be strongly correlated with each other. And this is actually consistent with what we've observed in practice. So it turns out that we can predict with very good accuracy which operations are going, which candidate architectures are going to do well on the held out validation set simply by looking at their behavior on the training set. So in this work, uh, we have demonstrated that it is possible to do architecture search efficiently um, using weight sharing even without relying on an explicit hyper network or a reinforcement learning controller. And I've also presented here these two interlocking experiments. First, that by looking at the model's behavior on the training set, we can predict which um, architectures will have the best accuracy is according to the one-shot model on a held out validation set. And second, once we know that, that information strongly correlates with which architectures will do well if we go back and retrain them from scratch. So that is pretty much it. Um, uh, if you're interested in learning more, please stop by our poster number 170 at the session tonight. So we have time for a couple of questions. There is a microphone here and there if you uh, want to ask one. Yeah. Hey, so it seems like the, um, for when you're doing the training with the path dropout, the results are going to be affected by the initial choices of like the, the possible um, options that you choose. Like if I had, you know, 99 small variants on a three by three convolution and then, you know, only one option for a five by five convolution, the other layers in the network are going to sort of expect the three by three convolution and then may give, you know, less performance there. So, I mean, is that an issue that like, that you've encountered or how might you mitigate that? So is the question whether these operations are going to co-adapt or there will be interactions with, between different operations? Right, yeah. Um, so it is certainly a concern. I think that there is, for the search space that we experimented with here, it seemed like we could make decisions for different layers largely independent of each other and get good results, but it's certainly possible that there are other search spaces that, where this is not the case, where these interactions are more important. Thank you. Oh, all right, actually we don't have time for a second question. If the next speaker can come.
Okay. Okay. No problem. All right. So the next talk will be given by Han Kai, and it's on the paper path level network transformation for efficient architecture search. Okay, yes. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm Han Cai from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. It's my pleasure to be here to introduce our work about neural architecture search. Neural network architectures would be an essential part that we need to optimize when applying deep learning techniques. Conventionally, this work is done by human experts, which is slow and suboptimal. Therefore, with increased computational resources, researchers start to use machine learning tools such as reinforcement learning and neural evolution to automate the architecture design process, which is known as neural architecture search. Most of current neural architecture search methods follow a similar paradigm, that is, they would explore a given architecture space uh, starting from scratch, guided by validation signals. Uh, a typical example is using a randomly initialized uh, autoregressive recurrent neural network to generate the whole string that corresponds to a specific architecture. And the recurrent neural network is chained to maximize the uh, expected validation performances through policy gradient algorithm. This is a, a flexible framework and has shown state-of-the-art results on benchmark datasets such as CIFA and ImageNet. However, there are still some drawbacks. First, they usually require vast computational resources to achieve uh, good results. Second, an undesirable fact is that many of such methods still fail to be the best human designed architectures. So here is the idea. If we cannot uh, easily surpass existing successful architectures, why not take advantage of them? Actually, such an idea has been explored in some recent works. Instead of starting from scratch, they would use an existing network as a start point and explore the architecture space by network transformation operations. Specifically, net-to-net -net operations are employed to widen or deepen a network and network compression operations are employed to compress the network. By using a good start point, it is much easier for such methods to achieve competitive results, which is good. However, uh, the bad part of such works is that their transformation operations are essentially layer level operations, such as adding or pruning filters and inserting or removing a layer. So they cannot modify the topology of connection paths of a neural network, which means that they would always lead to a chain-structured network when given a chain-structured start point. But considering the fact that uh, existing uh, human-designed state-of-the-art architectures such as inception models and ResNets have gone beyond simple chain-structured layout and shown the benefits of carefully customized past topologies, uh, it would be a critical issue for such transformation-based methods. So uh, our aim in this work is to address this problem. So our solution starts with some simple uh, observations. Consider a convolution layer. If we set each branch in a multi-branch structure to be a replication of this layer, then given the same input, uh, each branch would certainly produce the same output, and an average of these outputs also equals to the uh, output of the convolution, convolution layer. As such, we can construct an, an equivalent multi-branch structure that is merged by add for a convolution layer. And similarly, uh, to construct an equivalent multi-branch structure that is merged by concatenation, we can split the convolution layer into several parts along the output channel dimension and assign each part to the corresponding branch. Then a uh, concatenation of their outputs also equals to the convolution layer's output. So for, for other types of layers, such as identity layer and depth-wise separable convolution layer, these equivalent substitutions can be done analogously. And furthermore, if we uh, combine these equivalent uh, substitutions with net-to-net -net operations, we can arbitrarily modify the path topology of a neural network. Uh, here is a simple example. In step A and B, 
we apply equivalent substitutions to a convolution layer and an identity layer respectively. And in step C, we replace an identity layer with a depth-wise separable convolution layer that is initialized to be identity through net-to-net -net operations. As a result, we transform the single layer into a new structure that has substantially different path topology. Uh, actually, this new structure can be represented with a tree uh, as is shown in step D. So we name it as tree structure cell. It's worth mentioning that current multi-branch structures can be viewed as tree structure cells with a depth of one. So formally, a tree structure cell consists of nodes and edges. At each node, we have an allocation scheme that determines how the input feature map is allocated to each branch, and a merge scheme that determines how the, uh, the, the outputs of branches are merged. And a node is connected to each of its child nodes via an edge that is defined as a primitive operation, such as convolution, pooling, identity, and so on. <coughs> so given the input uh, feature map X, the output of a node is defined recursively based on the output of its child nodes. As shown in this figure, the, uh, the input feature map is first allocated to each branch. Then, at each branch, the allocated feature map is processed by the corresponding age and child node. Finally, they are merged to produce an output. So, to explore the tree structured architecture space proposed, we use a reinforcement learning metacontroller, similar to previous transformation based works. The policy network here comprises an encoder network for encoding the input architecture into a low dimensional vector and various softmax classifiers for generating corresponding network transformation actions. Furthermore, since the input architecture now has a tree structured topology that cannot be easily specified with a sequence of tokens. So we use a tree structured encoder network here. Specifically, beside the normal LCTM unit that is used to perform hidden state transition on edge, we incorporate two additional tree structured LCTM units that are proposed by a previous work in ACL to perform hidden state transition on nodes. With these three LCTM units, the whole process is done in a bottom up and top down manner to make the hidden state at each node to contain all information of the architecture, similar to bi-directional LCTM. Then, given the hidden state at each node, three different types of decisions are made. The first type is to determine whether or not to transform a node to have multiple nodes, child nodes. Both the merge scheme and number of branches are predicted. The second type is to determine whether or not to insert a new node. And the third type is to replace an identity mapping with a layer chosen from the set of possible primitive operations. So in, in our experiments, similar to other neural architecture search works, we focus on learning CNN cells on CIFA-10 for the image classification task and transfer the learned cell structures to ImageNet. We use state-of-the-art human-designed architectures, including DenseNet and PyramidNet as base networks Additionally, we use restricted computational resources for exploring the architecture space. The detailed structure of our best discovered tree structure cell is illustrated in this figure. It can be easily incorporated into any human design architectures by replacing normal three by three convolution layer with this cell. So, and the results, our results on sigma 10 are shown in this table. Well, compared to original DenseNet and PyramidNet, the learned cell significantly improves, improves their parameter efficiency and test error results. While compared to other neural architecture search works, specifically in NASNet, we can achieve lower test error rate with about half fewer parameters. More importantly, we employ much fewer computational resources in exploring the architecture space than NASNet. When transferred to ImageNet in the mobile setting, our learned cell can still achieve slightly better results compared to NASNet. 
So in conclusion, we introduced path level transformation operations to enable path topology modifications. And we explore a tree structured architecture space with a, a tree structured IO metacontroller. Our method using restricted computational resources can achieve better results on CIFAR, CIFAR and ImageNet in the mobile setting by taking advantage of both uh, existing successful human designed architectures and the great ability of neural architecture search methods in designing effective path topologies. Thanks a lot for your listening. Can the next speaker um, put his presentation? Hey everyone, my name is Chu. This is a joint work with Andrew Dai, Tang, and Quark at Google Brain. So in this work, we look at the problem of learning long-term dependencies in RNN, uh, not only in the pr perspective of solving this vanishing and exploding gradients, we also look at the training time of the whole system, as well as memory usage during training and inference. So uh, this is our method. It's pretty simple. Uh, suppose this is the RNN that you are trying to train, we would first sample a random point across this long RNN, and we call it an anchor point, and we would insert an auxiliary uh, loss at this anchor point. Uh, one way to do so is to first sample a sub-sequence of the input that happened before this anchor point, and we would insert the first token of this sub-sequence into a second decoder network. This decoder network is different from the main RNN, and it is uh, initialized by the state at the anchor point. And we would ask this decoder network to predict the rest of the subsequence. Um, so we call this reconstruction because we're, what we're trying to do is to memorize the part, the past. Um, more importantly, we would truncate old uh, gradient backpropagation, both from the supervised loss signal as well as the unsupervised loss signal. Um, another way to build this uh, unsupervised loss is to ask the decoder network to predict the next token that happened right after this anchor point uh, in a language modeling fashion. So we can repeat this process several times uh, to build more auxiliary, auxiliary loss across uh, multiple points across this input sequence. And by stopping gradients uh, at both the supervised loss and uh, unsupervised loss, we are able to train faster because we are not backpropagating a lot. And also we use much less memory because uh, since we are not backpropagating a lot, we don't have to remember a lot of calculation in the forward pass. In our experiments, uh, sequence length could be uh, could range up to 16,000, but the total number of uh, backpropagated gradient step is only around 600. To give a toy experiment that demonstrate the intuition behind why reconstruction loss and truncated backpropagation work, uh, consider the binary classification task uh, of sequence of eight bits. Suppose that we would classify the sequence as positive if um, the first and the fifth bits are both one, and we would classify the sequence as negative otherwise. If you train a normal recurrent neural network uh, for this task and look at the gradient norms at every time step, you'll see a pattern that uh, the gradient norm kind of peaks at the two salient uh, point in this input sequence. And this, is, uh, this can be problematic uh, if there's thousands of time steps in between these two points because gradient will start having problem backpropagating between these two. So what if we put a reconstruction head uh, in the middle of this input sequence? Then uh, the pattern of gradient norm would change. Uh, majority of the gradient would shift it towards the end of this uh, uh, sequence. And if we build more reconstruction loss, 
uh, you'll see the majority of the gradients at the beginning of the sequence would be really close to zero. So if you were to take a full gradient step, which is basically taking the sum of gradient across all time step, uh, truncated back propagation would approximate that pretty well. So that make the case for the combination of reconstruction and uh, truncated back propagation. So in the first uh, set of experiments, we look at image classification uh, pixel uh, by using an RNN that read uh, each image pixel by pixel, uh, which is a pretty classical test in uh, long-term dependency uh, literature. For MNIST and PMNIST, we got pretty competitive results, especially on PMNIST, we have our methods uh, uh, decisively uh, better than the baselines. We add to this uh, set of experiments um, CIFAR-10, which is slightly longer than MNIST, and uh, the problem is much harder. And for this test, we observe that our method is uh, outperformed the baseline uh, by a large margin. We also look at uh, text, uh, in particular uh, DBpedia document classification at character level. Um, so in the last line uh, is our method. As you can see in this table, uh, our method is only behind a 29 layer convolution neural network. So, so far we only look at sequences up to 1000, which is not really long. In this uh, set of experiment, we focus on sequences from 2000 up to uh, 16,000. Um, the red curve is LSTM. It's turned out it's really hard to train LSTM by full backpropagation at this range of uh, input length. But the two variants of our method uh, perform much better. If you put in transformer, uh, you can see the accuracy at the beginning is really good, but it decays really fast. Now, so far, we only train our uh, method with a single loss head, auxiliary loss head. Uh, what if we build more? So we we train uh, 20. We train uh, another uh, method, uh, another model of our method with 20 auxiliary loss head, and what we have is that dotted blue line, which we basically close the gap of accuracy with the transformer at the beginning, and we stay at the top throughout. Uh, what about time? Um, we measure the average time taken to finish one single training step for each of the model, and the gray bar, as you can see, is the uh, is that time for an LSTM. Since we are doing full backpropagation, the, this time kind of uh, grow linearly with the length of the input sequence, uh, while our variance of our methods uh, stay much lower than that. One of the analyses we did in our work is to look at the supervised gradients, which is gradient backpropagated from this supervised loss. We asked the question, how, uh, which is the blue arrow. We asked the question how much we can shrink this uh, supervised gradient length or not to, so as to not to hurt this uh, performance of the whole system too much. Um, so for this experiment, we look at CIFAR-10 uh, this input sequence length is around 1,000, and we shrink the supervised gradient backpropagation from 300 down to 1 and 0, uh, which is going from left to right in the graph. To the far right, uh, you can see the um, performance when you're not doing any supervised gradient backpropagation, uh, which is uh, the accuracy here is still pretty good uh, comparing to random accuracy. And at 50 uh, time step back propagation, you can still see that uh, you can still see that the accuracy of our method kind of approximate that of the LSDM uh, accuracy when trained with full back propagation of 1,000 step. And with that, I'd like to end my presentation. I'm happy to take questions now. Time for one question. Um, if not, let's thank the speaker again and this thank end you. the session.